Well, let's go back to uh, First Peter as we continue our study through this book. It's good to be spending some time thinking about this topic that is, we've highlighted is the main theme of this book, a living hope in a hostile world. And I know I've uh, often come into this focused on the hostility of the world, but I think we really need to focus on the hope and be reminded of that, that we do have a living hope. You know, there isn't hope as we look out around the world. And I, I've really felt this in my own life this week. You know, as I kind of go, look, I'm just not going to, whatever the news is, you know, I'm just going to kind of switch off a bit from that. And, uh, and you know, we're not going to find it by looking around the world. There is no hope. Maybe some people, you know, said elections, all these other things, changes. Not going to find it not going to find it in this world, not going to find it in the things of this world. We're also not going to find it really as we look within. Some people realise and, you know, they look out at the world and they see everything going on and they just go, well, look, I just got to, I can't trust anything or anyone in the world. I just have to depend upon myself. Well, the Bible tells us our heart is deceitful and wicked above all things. Who can know it? And, and the idea here is that, you know, our heart is desperately sick because of our sin. And the reminder here is that even though we may at times think that we can find hope in our, some people say their inner strength, their abilities, their resources, their ability to kind of um, withstand or endure, you know, we're not going to find it there either. And uh, we need to be reminded of that. Well, where do we find our hope? We find our hope in the Lord, in the Lord alone, in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the promises of God, in the person of God through Jesus Christ, in the salvation that he has so richly provided for us and that is our living hope, past, present and future. We've been considering that um, in these uh, opening passages in First Peter. And as we said, Peter provides encouragement to us through this book. Firstly, by reminding us of the fact that, you know, this world isn't our home. As that song goes, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. We are pilgrims and strangers. You know, we are, even though we live in this world, uh, we are not of this world, and this world is not our final destination. And, and if we remember that, um, that will help us to look at the world around us, not with great despair, but really with anticipation of what awaits us. And we've been told that as believers, we can praise God. We noticed in the first part here, we can bless or praise God for the living hope that we have been begotten to, that we've been born again unto, born again through entering into a personal relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ and in him alone. And we've told that that uh, blessed hope, that living hope that we have is a future hope in what awaits us, an inheritance undefiled up there in heaven. It's a present hope, it, even that we can rejoice in the trials that we're going through right now, knowing that God will use those trials in the life of a believer to make him, uh, mould him and make him more dependent upon him. And then the reminder also that this was God's plan all along. And that, so whether we look to the future, we look to the present, we look to the past, we can praise God for this wonderful salvation. And now, of course, Peter moves into the response to this. How are we going to respond to this? What are we going to do about it? You know, um, we don't, you know, our salvation is secure. We don't need to do anything to keep our salvation. But God says, because of this, we should respond in a certain way. And the rest of this book is really... Uh, bears out the practical application of this. And I said last week that um, it, be it begins in verse 13 of this. And I did, I said someone had counted out 35 commands. I actually found a list of the commands, so they, and we'll, we'll see them as we go through all the different commands that are given to us as a response as to why we're to live out our lives on this earth with our focus fixed on what awaits us as pilgrims and strangers. And so Peter's writing, Peter, of course, giving us hope as he's writing about the hope that he has. And he is now the aged apostle as he writes this, but he's writing to those who are scattered, particularly in what we call Asia Minor, Turkey, and the, those areas and uh, areas of there at that time, who were facing persecution. And he's encouraging them in the trials and the struggles they're going through, how to, how to suffer for the Lord in this world but also how to have that living hope. So we're going to pick it up again from where we were last week, and we're going to read from verse 13 again, and I just want to focus on one verse today. I was uh, thinking of moving through a bit more, but when I came to verse 17, and as I've 
spent some time with the Lord and spent some time in his word and, and studied this, there's a lot for us to learn in this, particularly about the fear of God. That's what I want us to understand. That I think we need to have... Often the, the, what we think about the fear of God is kind of... To me, my life has also been a bit skewed as well. And I think we need to understand really what it means to live out our lives in godly fear. So let's read from 13 to 17... Uh, and we'll see these, these commands, and 17 is the one that we're going to focus on today. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 17. And Peter, speaking to these believers, says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children... Not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if you call upon the Father, who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work, Pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Let's pray. Lord, we're thankful again for the reminder that in this world that is sinking fast, Lord, we have a solid hope, a solid rock in you. We've sung about you being our refuge. You are the almighty God. You're the one that guides our footsteps so we won't fall. And Lord, we can indeed trust that you uh, will bring to completion not only the events of this world, but of course our salvation, that we'll soon be with you and we will be able to give you glory and praise you without the hindrance of the sin of this world. But Lord, you've called us to live in this world right now and to live out these, our lives. And so, Lord, help us to understand uh, how we are to do that. As we've just read, Lord, we understand the need for a disciplined mind, we understand the need for holiness, but Lord, also help us to understand what it truly means to, to live in, in the fear of you, Lord. And we pray that you'd teach us from your word today, empower me to teach and preach this from uh, your word by your Holy Spirit, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So reading those verses, and this is part of the overall passage that we'll, we're examining in in these coming few weeks as well he said what are the required responses to that salvation that we have to that living hope yes we're secure in christ we have that living hope how do we live out our lives now well we saw that the first command was to hope to the end that we are to continue in that hope that confidence that we have it's not a wishful thinking it's a confidence that we have and that is to be focused on the, the end game, the end goal, the, the revelation that is to be brought to us at Jesus Christ, the grace that has been brought to us. We experience God's grace right now, but we're going to experience it in its ultimate when we go to be with, with Christ. And we, of course, look forward to that day. We're told that because of that, we should gird up the loins of our mind. We said that means to really to be prepared, to uh, have a disciplined mind, to live in this life as we are right now. And he goes on to tell us that because of we have a relationship with God as our Heavenly Father, because we are now his children, we are to be obedient children. And we are to live out our lives in holiness. Why? Because that's who God is. God is holy. We know holy uh, for God is perfect. Holy for us, we can never be perfect, but he wants us to be like him, distinct, set apart set apart from this world, not entangled in all the things of this world. And it's so easy, I find, to get entangled in all the affairs of this world, the things of this world, the, um, the, the, all the entertainment, the intoxicating things, all of those things that we're told. And so he's told us that we're to be sober, we're to be holy. And now we come to the verse 17, which gives us again another uh, instruction as to how we are, the attitude that we're to have. And it tells us here that we're to pass the time of sojourning here in fear. That's what we're going to look at this morning. And then as we move on a little bit in a couple of weeks, we'll see that we are to love one another fervently. So we are, to, we're chosen by God uh, to be his children. We're to be set apart for him. 
and we're to live holy lives. Not perfect lives, but we should be growing in holiness. We should be growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord and really desiring to please him. And this next part tells us about how we're to do that, the attitude of the mindset. We are to live with godly fear. Notice this uh, end part of this passage. And what I want us to look at this morning is I'm going to look at, the, again, the end part of the passage and then we'll go back and look at the, the first part of this verse. Where to pass the time, uh, it says, live out your present life. Pass the time, that word pass is the same word conversation that we've heard. You know, it means the way you live. So even though we are living in this world, even though we're living in anticipation of that future hope, that living hope, right now, how are we to live? Well, we're to live out our time, our present life. We're to pass the time. Often when people think about passing the time, they're looking at their watch, they're just waiting, you know, trying to wait for the next event. Well, we're not just sitting around waiting. God doesn't want us just to sit here and wait. We are to live out this life. We're to pass our time. And it mentions here of our sojourning. Now, you know, we don't use the word sojourner that much anymore, but the idea is that, um, and the, the original word from this is really the idea of someone who's an outsider. God says that's exactly how we should feel in this world. We're pilgrims, we're strangers. And the idea of a pilgrim, a stranger, is that they haven't set up camp. They're not here permanently, they're just passing through. And so this idea here is, you know, we're just walking through this world. We're just traveling through this world. And that reminds us that as we live out our days, as pilgrims, as those who are just moving through this world, that we shouldn't cling on to things uh, of this world too tightly. We shouldn't be distracted by the things of this world. And then he reminds us here that how are we to live out this time as a stranger in this world? Well, he mentions here we're to live it out with fear. Now, he doesn't mention expressly there what kind of fear, but if we look at earlier in the verse and we look at the context of it, we understand this is dealing with the fear, the fear of God. God, we, early in this verse, we'll come back to is, is our heavenly father and he's also the judge. And so we want to understand what it means about when he talks about we're to live with fear. Now, you know, this word fear is in the Greek, the word phobos, where we get the word phobia from, you know, and people have all sorts of phobias and fears. And the word means to be in terror of, to be exceedingly afraid of. And so that's one of the meanings of the word, you know, to be scared of. And that is used in times throughout the Bible with that thought. And then there's another meaning of it as well, which has this idea of being in reverence of. And I think we need to understand, often we very quickly go to the fact that, oh, it's not to be afraid of, it's to be in reverence of, but it is both. And we'll understand that a little bit more as we, as we go through this, is that we are to live our lives in fear of the Lord. No, we're not afraid of the judgment of the Lord, but we should live with that reverence and understand he is almighty God, as we sang this morning. He is all powerful. And we need to understand that um, I think one of the things that we see today in the world uh, and particularly in the church is there's been a, a, a downplaying of the fear of God. And, you know, uh, God is the God of all comfort. He's the one that comforts us. But we shouldn't get too comfortable with God. You know, people, a lot of the worship today and a lot of the way people, they treat Jesus. We, we sing, of course, what a friend we have in Jesus. But he's not our buddy. We need to remember that. He is God. And God is God and he is awesome and he is holy and he deserves to be feared and feared in the right way. And that's what we're going to look at a bit this morning. And so Peter uh, mentions here that we're to live out our lives in fear. I want to just show you the other times that Peter uses this same word, phobos, in the book of First Peter. And what we'll see is most of the time he is, is about reverence. There's one time where it talks about actual fear or terror. In 1 Peter 2.18, he says, Servants, do be subject to your masters with all fear. So he's not telling them, be scared of your bosses. He's saying you need to have a respect or a reverence for them. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. In 1 Peter 3.2, he's talking about wives and their relationship to their husbands and how they, if their husband is not a believer, that they can win their husband to the Lord by the way that they live. Not talking to them all the time and, and rattling on about this, but he says that, that your husbands will behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. He's not saying, wives, be very afraid of your husbands. You know, 
for what they might do. Sadly, sometimes some wives are because of maybe the husbands aren't very nice people. But here it's talking about the fact that you are to, again, have reverence, respect. Um, now, the third one here is the one that really is talking about that fear and afraid of. It says, talking about suffering, and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror. These are the ones that are trying to hurt you. They're trying to scare you. These are the people that are persecuting you. Neither be troubled. So here it is talking about that, that um, terror, that fear. And then the last one, uh, which we notice just after this, it says, but sanctify the Lord God in your heart. Set him apart and be always ready to give an answer to every man for the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, with reverence towards the Lord. So I just mentioned those so that you understand that uh, when Peter's talking about this, most of the time he's talking about that reverential awe of God. But it can, in the New Testament and throughout the scriptures, we refer to both. Well, I think what we need to do is we need to understand uh, really what it means, this biblical truth about what it comes to mean about fearing God. And this is something that I've been studying a little bit and I'm growing a little bit more in my understanding. Um, What do you think about when you think about the fear of God? Maybe you think about that the fear of God is really only for unbelievers. Certainly unbelievers should be fearful of God. Jesus actually said, I say to you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body and after that have no more uh, that they can do. But I will warn of you of who you say you shall fear. Fear him that after you have killed hath the power to cast you into hell. Yea, I say, fear him. It says in Hebrews, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. God is the judge and he will judge, as we understand, everyone. But specifically, there will be a judgment for those who are without Christ. And you should be fearful of that. If you don't know Jesus Christ, we read Revelation chapter 20. We read other parts as we had in Revelation. It's a fearful thing. And so therefore, there should be a fear for that. But that fear that we have for God isn't just for unbelievers maybe you think that the fear of god is just an old testament thing we read a lot about the fear of god you know we see god in the old testament leading the nation of israel we see him as a dark cloud over the mount sinai we see him as the pillar of cloud by day the pillar of fire by night we see all of his mighty acts in the old testament and there is certainly a lot that's said about the fear of god in the old testament you might say well that that was the god of the old testament who's the god that to be feared you know the god of the new testament is the god of love and you know and we're not to be, be fearful of god we need to um have a love for god and there's while uh, we understand that god is love he's always been love old testament and new testament those that doesn't change about him god is love and, but yet God is light and God is also holy. We understand all these different things. And so they remain. So we can't just kind of put this back into the Old Testament. Now, there's quite a number of verses, of course, in the Bible that tell us to fear not. Someone has said once, you know, there's, there's uh, one for every day of the year. 365, I've encountered them. It may be true where, where the, God says, fear not. And how do we then correlate that? How it, when God says fear not, and then we're supposed to have the fear of God, and we're told here we're supposed to live out the fear of God, obviously there's something we need to understand about that. Maybe you think that fearing God is okay as a Christian, but um, it's not the best way to relate to God. Yes, we, we can relate to God in fear. We understand he's a holy God, but we should just relate to him in love. Well, we need to in both, and we need to understand really who God is in all of this. Now, the thing that we first need to discover and realise is that fearing God is an essential reality for all believers. You may not think, that you, if you're a believer, you may not understand it, but you already fear God. When we, we're going to look at what fearing God means uh, a bit this morning. But the two key verses that we're told in the Old Testament, that you know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And fools despise wisdom and instruction. We're told in Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so if we want to have wisdom, we want to have knowledge, we want to have understanding of who God is, then we have to begin with the fear of the Lord. We have to understand that God is God and we're not, and we need to 
look to him and reverence him. And someone's explained it a bit like this. Is you look at a bicycle wheel, you have a hub in the middle. And the hub is the core of it. And all the spokes are the ones that go out. You can have all these spokes, but if you don't have the hub in the middle, the bike wheel is going to fall flat. It's not going to, to do that. And so the idea here is there are lots of people in the world who think they're wise. They have all this academic knowledge and they have all the spokes and things like that, but they don't have the hub. And the hub is the fear of the Lord. Really, it all begins with a, a, a fear of God, an understanding of who God is. Um, and if we are going to come to God, as we're told in Hebrews, we have to understand that he is and he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. But we understand that, you know, he is God and we're not. You know, the, the, the sin of pride, the sin of uh, Satan back in the beginning of Lucifer is that I will be as God. He wanted God's place. We need to understand that he is the almighty. He is above all of us. He is uh, our creator and we are his creatures. And that's the reminder of that. It's interesting in that um, David in Psalm 36 begins, he says, the transgression of the wicked says in my heart, there is no fear of God in their eyes. He, David says, and I look out the world and I look at the way people sin, uh, it says they have no fear of God. And that's true of most of the world. Most of the world has no fear of God. They, have a very, uh, they think of God as trite, old fashioned, even they have a casual, they mock him. And we know that uh, certainly if you have that attitude towards God, you're not going to come to God. You're not going to receive his gift of salvation and you will face the judgment that awaits. Now, what does it mean for a believer to fear God? This is what I want to spend a little bit of time on this morning. And I'm going to jump through quite a few Bible verses. Don't try to write them all down because <laughs> we're going to be going through it. I, really what I want you to do is I want some of these things to sink in. So as I will bring a few up on the screen, I'm going to read quite a number of them as well. And just for sake of time, we can't turn to all of them, but, but I hope that you'll see um, what it means for a believer to fear God. So the first thing we need to understand is a believer's fear of God should not be the fear of eternal judgment. You and I, because we are in Christ, are secure and we don't need to fear about uh, eternal judgment, that we will face judgment for our sins. 1 John 4, 15 through 18, let me share it with you. It says, Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth of him, and he in God. And we've known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. We don't have fear in the day of judgment. We can have a boldness. Why? Because as he is, so are we in this world. Because of our relationship with Jesus Christ, because of faith in Jesus Christ, we are in a personal relationship with God. We are saved. We use the term saved. We have been saved from the penalty of sin. We will not face that judgment. God has, has manifested his love towards us and we've received that love through Jesus Christ. There is no fear in love is what we're told here. But perfect love casts out fear because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So perfect love um, casts out fear. We should have no fear of that day of judgment. As one person put here, if you have trusted in Jesus Christ for salvation, fear of the future judgment for your sin is illegitimate because Jesus was judged in your place and by faith in him, his atonement was applied to your account. What it means is if you as a believer fear a future judgment of, by God for your sin, you're dishonouring Jesus Christ. You're saying Christ's sacrifice was not enough. Christ didn't fully save to the uttermost. When he said it is finished, that was not true. And so the reality is we should never fear eternal judgment. We're secure, we're safe in Christ. There are some people and some people within Christianity that teach that you, you have to persevere, you know, or, or they teach you can lose your salvation. But the Bible is clear, you know, that we are secure in Jesus Christ. We've considered that both in Peter and in some other things as well. So if we're not to uh, be in fear of eternal judgment, what does it mean for us to fear God? Well, here's how it's been described. It's a family fear. What do we mean by this? It's the term that's used, and we don't use this term uh, today, it's called filial fear. Uh, and the idea here is it's centred on our relationship. Um, as one writer put, the fear of a child who is in awe of his father and doesn't want to do anything to violate their relationship. 
a little child that looks up to his dad and says, he's my dad. You know, he's greater than me. And, and I love him. And I know he loves me. And I don't want to do anything. I'm afraid of anything that might violate that relationship. Not sever it. You're always a child of God. But that would affect it. That would damage the fellowship. Not sever the relationship. You and I, as I said, being born again, we're children of God. But it's this idea that we see, we understand that God is pure, he's just, and here the believers should not, as we're told here, we shouldn't fear God for eternal judgment, but as a, a child of God, we should fear him and reverence him and desire to not offend him, not to displease him. And, you know, God is not, we said, sitting there trying to pick us up on everything. But there are things that please God and things that displease God. And the Bible is quite clear about some of those things. And we can't just ignore them. We can't just take a, you know, the, again, this idea that I said, you know, well, God's our buddy. And people call him, you know, the man upstairs or Jesus is our buddy. You know, no, we shouldn't have that casual approach. He is almighty God. As we sang today, he's the creator of the universe. And he deserves our reverence and he deserves our fear. The third thing I want us to see is that the believer's fear of God is produced by the Holy Spirit. Let me just uh, share with you from Isaiah 11, 1 and 2. And this is speaking of the Messiah. This is speaking of Jesus. So Isaiah has a lot of times where he's looking forward. He's looking forward to the Messiah. We know that there's a lot of prophetic material in Isaiah that speaks of the Messiah is who is to come. And this is speaking of Messiah in Isaiah 11, verses 1 and 2. And there shall come forth out of the stem of Jesse, and a, a branch shall grow out of his roots. So we're referring to a descendant of Jesse, a descendant of David. You know, Jesus refers to himself as the son of David. And this is what it says about this Messiah. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge, and of fear of the Lord. Now, this is a very interesting one because we understand that Jesus, the Messiah, came into this world, took on human flesh and lived fully God, but also fully man. Did Jesus, the Messiah, in his humanity, have a fear of God? Well, yes, he did. That's what it's telling us here. Jesus, the man, had a fear, a reverence for God. The Father, yes, he did. The Spirit produced it in him. We're told that the Spirit came upon him in his humanity. Now, that's a little bit hard for us to kind of comprehend because we go, well, hey, Jesus is God. You know, what does it talk about? He has the fear of God. But we're talking about the, the man Jesus. When he, he took on humanity, in his humanity, he had a fear of God. And if Jesus had a fear of God, we should have a fear of God as well. You know, the believer's fear of God is, as someone has mentioned, it's like a reflex. You know, when, you, I don't know if they still do it, when they go to the doctor, do they ever sort of tap on your knee and you have to kick? I think I did. I, a, a year ago, so ago, when I was having some brain scans and that, they did that. They tapped on your knee and, you know, your knee kind of reflexes. It's the natural reflex, uh, reflex that you have when you get hit on the knee. Well, the natural reflex in the life of a believer with the Holy Spirit working in his life is that we should fear God. You know, the, the, we should understand that that is what the Holy Spirit produces in us. It produces in us a fear of God. Now, we're going to look at a little bit more about what this means in our lives in a moment. But here's the next point. A, belie a believer's fear of God is a recognition of God's glory and holiness. We, as we said, understand God is glorious and he is holy. We've just read previously in verse uh, 16 here, be ye holy for I am holy. We understand that his, his glory is his unique excellence. You know, we look at something as glorious because it's, it's brilliant, it's um, powerful. And God is uniquely excellent. And we also understand his holiness means that he is not just pure but set apart. He's distinct. And so when we think about God, he is glorious, he is holy, he is uniquely excellent, he's set apart, he's distinct, and that is the way that we should look at him. And as we, and not just the way we look at him, that is the way that he is. And if we understand it and we recognize that, that should cause us to live in fear, in reverence. And that fear, yes, is a reverential awe, but it actually can work out, as we see often in the scriptures, when people are confronted by God, what do they do? Go up and shake his hand? No, they fall flat on their face. 
Isaiah um, chapter 6. Remember, Isaiah was in the temple and he said, The Lord, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And he saw this amazing vision of God and he saw the angels around there that were cried, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory and the doorpost shook. And then and, and Isaiah f- fell down and said, Woe is me, for I am undone. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. This is the King of kings. He is unlike anything or anyone else. And when you're confronted with God, that's the fear that they had. You could say that's, yeah, people say that's an Old Testament fear. No, that's the fear that everyone has. And we see it even here in the New Testament. You know, in Exodus chapter 20, when God said he would meet with the people at Mount Sinai, Um, You know, it says that he came and there was a a cloud that came around the mountain. And in Exodus 20, uh, we read here that all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings. This is Exodus 20, 18 through 20. And the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. When the people saw it, they removed and stood far off. And they said unto Moses, speak thou with us and we will hear. But let not God speak to us, lest we die. They are fearful of God of his might and his power and of course his potential to judge as well and Moses said unto the people fear not for God is come to prove you that his fear may be before your faces that you sin not when you are living in the fear of God you will not sin right? you, will, you, you know if what we often say is you know if if God if Jesus Christ walked into you know your house he walked into your home walked into your work you know would you change what you're doing? A lot of us would. We're kind of like, you know, um, the, the idea here is that, you know, we are to live our lives in the presence of God. We'll come to that a little bit more. Jeremiah 5.22, Fear ye not me, saith the Lord. Will you not tremble at my presence, which have placed the sand for the bound and of the sea for a perpetual decree that it cannot pass and the waves there, tossed thereof, yet they cannot prevail, though they roar, yet they pass not over it. And we think of what God has control of this entire universe. I I don't know about you, but when I go out and I just look at the the creation and everything around us, and you go out and you look at everything in the open, you go down here, you look at the beach and you see those roar of the waves, you go, what a mighty God. And, you know, it just should, again, remind us of in awe and in reverence of him. Psalm 47, for the king most high is terrible. We hear that in the King James. It's the idea of he's reverent, he's to be feared. He's a great king over all the earth. You know, we see other kings. We see all these people at the moment, these leaders coming and going, people, you know, changes of government, people with elections. They're all trying to vie to have the first place. But, you know, there's a king, as we read this morning, there's a king that's over all those kings. And there's a king that will bring all those kings into submission. So every time you see a, a Putin, a Zelensky, a Biden, or whoever it is, you know, even a local Dan Andrews or whatever, every time that they're sort of thinking, I'm in charge here, they're not. They've got their little place right now in history. And uh, yet we understand that God is the king of kings. He is the king of kings right now, but he will come and he will reign over the earth. Psalm 2 reminds us of that. Be wise now. In Psalm 2, verses 10 to 12, be wise now, O kings. He instructed judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and trembling. Hey, all these kings, you better know who God is. If you know who God is, you will trust in him for salvation. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and he perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. A recognition of his glory and holiness. I I won't go uh, to this passage, but you know when we were in Revelation and we saw Revelation chapter 1 and John saw this vision of the resurrected Christ and we saw that resurrect and it said that his feet were like brass and his hair was like uh, wool and his eyes were like fire and you read that and you read not only is he awesome he's distinct there's no one else like him and this is what it means for us to understand that there is no one else like God he is unlike anyone else he is almighty he is powerful and he is glorious and that is what it means for us to to have the fear of God and, and then the last point here in what it means for a believer to fear God is this, it is a response to God's mercy in Christ. A couple of verses here. 1 Samuel 12, 24. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. When you consider how great things he hath done for you, 
You know, it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance, we're told. When we understand the great mercy that God has shown to us, we should fall down before him. We should revere him. We should live in fear of him. And probably the, uh, one of the verses here that he describes this best is in Psalm 130, verse 4. But there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. We have been forgiven. That should shake us to the core. You know, I was mentioning to Nick the other week, he said, I still can't understand why God made salvation available to me as a sinner. And yet I can't, I just, it amazes me that he did. And he also, it also amazes me that others don't receive that salvation as well. But, you know, it, it is something that we should recognize, you know, this is God's mercy towards us. And as we move on in the few, next week, in these few verses, it talks about the fact that we've been not redeemed by gold and silver, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And we'll reflect on that a little bit more. How is the fear of God expressed in the life of a believer? A believer's fear of God is expressed in the life of a life of reverent devotion to him and his glory. We're set apart to him. We're devoted to him. Now, I'm about to move through something here, and I, this isn't my list, but as I went through and read these verses, I thought this is, you'll see, we're going to have a bunch of verses here. And I'm going to show you, so don't try and write these down. Um, just listen uh, as we go through this. And there's 11 different, uh, and I say that's why, because there's 11 different ways that we find here that we, the fear of God is expressed in our life. Let me share these with you just quickly. The fear of God is expressed in the life of a believer through growing in progressive holiness or Christ-likeness. 2 Corinthians 7, 1, Having therefore uh, these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. How do we mature in holiness? We're told be holy, be holy. How do we mature in holiness? We do that by living in the fear of God. And we understand that we, 2 Corinthians 3.18 tells us that we're changed. When we see the glory of God, we're changed by his glory, by the spirit of the Lord. Fear of the Lord is expressed through, in our lives, through worshipping God. Psalm 96.19, I worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. Fear before him all the earth. As we worship God, we understand we fear God as well. Obedience to God's word, Ecclesiastes 12, 13, right at the end of that book. Solomon's talking about all these things of wisdom and futility and things like that. He finishes up, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. How do I sum it all up? Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For us, we need to fear God. We don't fear men. We're told the fear of man brings a snare. But, you know, we fear God. Our, our fear is toward the Lord. We do this through, we express it through delighting in God and his word. Psalm 112, praise ye the Lord, blessed is the man that feareth the Lord and delighteth greatly in his commandments. And as we read God's word, as we understand more of the character and the nature of God, you know, I, as I said this week, I've found, <laughs> just stop reading the news, stop reading all these internet articles, get back into the word of God, see the awesome and the magnificence of God and you know, it will not only settle you, it will help us to realise, you know, we, we can't live this life in just futility. We, we need to understand God is, we live our lives in the presence of God and we can delight in him as we read his word. We live, we express it through loving God, Deuteronomy 10, 12. And now Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the, the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways and to love him and serve the Lord God with all thy heart and all thy soul. God wants us to love him. He loved us before we loved him, we're told. And he wants us to express back to him the love that he has shown to us. Of course, we can never do that in any equal way. But as we love God, it also it's that family fear that I talked about. It's the fact that we understand that we live in uh, relationship with him that we love him a few more here pursuing God pursuing God uh, Hosea 3 5 and afterward the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in all the days you know, as we seek God 
as we find out about more about who God is, it will cause us to fear God, to live in that reverential devotion to him as well. And then through serving God, Deuteronomy 10, thou shall, uh, 20, thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, thou shalt serve him, and to him thou shalt cleave and swear by his name. You know, if we fear God, we will serve God. If we worship God, we will serve God. We've seen those relationships there. And then through humility, Humility, Proverbs 3, 5 and 7. You probably know these ones well. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not on to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Now here's the next part. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. What does it mean to be wise in your own eyes? Proud. Don't live in pride. Live in humility. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. And uh, that's another part there we could say in, even departing from evil is a way that we fear God. Prayer. Psalm 145 verse 19. He will fulfill, fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He will also hear their cry and save them. And then Nehemiah 1.11, Nehemiah prayed, Lord, I beseech thee, let not thine ear let now thy ear to be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name. As we fear God, we pray to him. We'll read this a little, uh, earlier in this verse. If we call upon the Father, as we call upon the Father, as we pray to him, that's another way that we live in the fear of God. And then finally, living for God's glory. In Revelation 15, 4, it says, Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? And as we live to glorify God, we're living in the fear of God. So what we understand here is that the fear of God, and I, I know that's been a lot there, but the fear of God isn't just about, you know, like, oh, I'm scared of God. It's not what we're talking about here. It's about understanding who God is. It's understanding his magnificence and his excellence and living a life of devotion to him. And these are some of the different ways that you can do that. You know, we can live a life as we pursue all these different things, as we, uh, again, grow in our understanding of who God is and, and what he has done for us. Well, let's come back to the first part of this verse just as I finish up this morning. And I want us to consider what should move us to do that. You know, we understand we're to live out the rest of our lives, our days of our sojourning. We're to live that out in fear and we're to have that godly fear. Why would we do that? You know, it's the same as what, why would we be holy? You know, what's, what's the motivation for that? You know, because some people and some Christians think, well, you know, it really doesn't matter how I live. I'm going to heaven anyway. All right. Now, you're going to heaven if you've trusted in Christ. Yes, you, you will escape eternal judgment. You will escape hell. You'll go to heaven. But who are you going to be with? God. We're going to be with God. We're going to be with our heavenly father. And so we need to understand who he is and understand that the way that we will relate to him there, yes, we will have no sin anymore. And so therefore we will be glorifying him. We will live in, in guess, the fear of God, the reverence of God in heaven. But we don't need to wait till then. In fact, we should be God is preparing us right now for that, for the time that we would be with him. So let's uh, just consider back what it says here earlier in this verse. In verse, uh, 1 Peter uh, 1, 17, And if ye call upon the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth, every, judgeth according to every man's work. So this is the reason. What is the motivation? Well, firstly, God's our Father. It says here, and if ye call upon the Father, but that if in the Greek is since ye call upon the Father. He's saying, if and yes, you do. If you're a believer, you call upon the Father. You've called upon him for salvation, but you continue to pray. You know, as a believer, maybe your prayer life, you, know, you find is not what it sh you would want it to be. But as believers, all of us should and do pray. We should talk to God. And so we understand because God is our Father and we, can, we call upon him because we pray, that is one of the things that moves us to this relationship. God also is judge, noticed here. It says, if we call upon the Father who without respect of persons judges. Now, there are judges in this world, but those judges in this world are all partial in some ways. They'll have be biased even when they don't realise they're biased. They're trying to be impartial. But God is the, the true impartial judge. He knows all things and his judgments are right. They're, they're perfect. And we're told here that he is the impartial judge of who? Of every man, of everybody. And so understanding that, he is the judge of everybody, living and dead, saved and unsaved, 
God is the impartial judge of every person, but of every person's work, it says here. When we talk about works, we understand we're not, we don't work to be saved, but God still evaluates every person's work. Now, for the unsaved, he's going to evaluate their work because in, in the day of the white throne judgment that we read about in Revelation 20, they're going to proclaim that, you know, I should come into heaven. You know, look at all my works. And he's going to show them their works and he's going to say, he's going to show them the Lamb's Book of Life. And it says every mouth will be stopped and they'll realize they can't get there by their works, their righteousness. In fact, so that great white throne judgment is not a judgment about whether you get to go to heaven or not. It's a judgment about what degree of punishment you'll get. Because some people have done more evil works than others, but we cannot get to heaven by our works. But God will judge the works of the unsaved, and we're told that he'll also judge the work of, uh, works of the saved. We talk, read about the judgment seat of Christ, and we're told that all of us will appear before the judgment seat of Christ in 2 Corinthians 5, that we may, uh, give a, we may receive the reward for those things done in our body, whether they be good or bad. In other words, we don't get judged for our sin, but we do get judged for how we've lived out our lives in obedience to him. What it comes down to this is you and I are utterly responsible before God. He knows everything about you. He knows, every, he knows and, he, and he's completely impartial. You can't bribe him. You know, it doesn't matter how much money, how much influence. There's nothing you can do to kind of say, well, okay, maybe just overlook this. No, everything we do will come before God. Now, I'm thankful that my sin is under the blood of Jesus Christ. And I won't be judged for my sin. Does God know about my sin? Yes, he does. Um, will he judge me for my sin? No, he says, Jesus Christ has paid that price. But even right now, God is evaluating our lives. He's presently evaluating our conduct. Now, notice here it says that the Father, uh, it talks here, a call by the, on the Father who judges according to every man's work. Now, I won't go into this for sake of time, but you, we do read in John 5 where Jesus says, The Father judgeth no man, but has committed all judgment to the Son. That's future judgment. So in other words, God the Father sees all of this, but Jesus Christ is his representative. And Jesus Christ, as the Son of Man, will judge all of mankind, whether that's the beamer seat of Christ for rewards, or whether it's the great white throne, which I believe is God the Son, who is because it talks about the Lamb's Book of Life, that both of, both of those things uh, he is, is doing. But right now, God is evaluating. He's evaluating us. And, and what we understand from that is that, you know, of course, if you're not saved, that should, that should drive you to, to run to Jesus Christ for salvation, the fact that God is evaluating you. But if you are saved, and here's the, this last part, God is presently evaluating our conduct and what what is God doing right now well even in this life he is disciplining us and you know sometimes we go oh things aren't going the way and often we think that discipline is for when you know we commit grievous sins God will chasten us we're told you know sometimes we go through suffering and some of that suffering that we go through is ch God's chastening it's his discipline but God isn't just disciplining us for those really grievous sins what we need to understand is God is constantly disciplining us. You know when you are a father and you have a little child and the little child you're saying, no, don't do that. You know, uh, don't play with your food. Pick that up off the floor. Remember to flush the toilet. All these different things that you're going on and saying that. And they're not, oh, you've done something really bad. It's just like, no, you need constant correction. And that's loving correction. And as we read, we, we read in Hebrews 12, it says that we are chastened or disciplined and that shows us that God loves us. That shows us that he, we're in relationship with him. A father disciplines and chastens his son. A loving father does that. And God does that and he's doing that all the time in our lives. So, you know, sometimes we go through struggles in our life and some of them, yes, are caused by others, but some of them, you know, we understand God is using those things even in, in our lives and we can rejoice as we said, not because of the suffering, but understanding that our loving Father um, is doing everything for his glory and our good. Right? It's all for his glory, but it's also for our good. As, as his children, you know, one of the things that as, as earthly fathers that we can't say that we do everything for our children, all that disciplining is good. Sometimes, I don't know, like you just get angry. You know? And you go, stop it, you know, and all this sort of stuff. And you, you can't, no, God doesn't do that. Doesn't, God doesn't get angry for no reason. He doesn't do that. He lovingly 
chastens and corrects us, you know. Um, the thing that we understand is that God is, um, he is good, but he's terrifyingly good. You know, he, everything he does is for, for our good and for his glory. And this is uh, one of the verses as I come to finish up this morning that I, I preached this from this passage at a funeral a couple of weeks ago to kind of bring people who were not believers to the attention of the fact that they lived their lives in God. But this verse is actually, this passage is to believers. Let's read what it says. None of us live to himself and none of us die to himself. Our life is not for us. He's saying, whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. What's it saying here? All of us, saved and unsaved, live our lives in the presence of God. You can't hide from him. You can't close the door and pretend, you know, you can't go, nobody's looking. I'm going to do this. Thing. No, we're told, you know, I read once, the character is who we are when God is, uh, when only God is watching and God's always watching. So we need to understand that because God is watching, we're living our lives in the presence of him and we should fear him. Fear him in, a, in the right way, not in a, in, in, a, as a, um, in a terrifying way, but we should fear him in the right way. We're told, for this end both cried, died and rose and revived, that he must be the Lord of both the dead and the living, and he is. Here's the counsel to us. You know, he's saying, why do you judge your brother? Why do you sit at not your brother? You know, you, we shouldn't be. And he, he says, because we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. As believers, we will give account for our lives and how we live them out. And as I said, it's not about sin. It's not about judgment of sin, but it is about a judgment for our service, our way that we've... And if we read back in 1 Corinthians 3, it talks about what sort of work it is. And, and there will be work that is... That we, things that we think we've done for the Lord, but we've really done for ourselves. And the idea is it's our motive for the Lord. So um, we're told further on here, as is written, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. Yes. So then every one of us shall give an account to God. And that's the thing we need to remember. We're living our lives in the fear of God because we will give account. So how we live out the rest of our lives here on this earth isn't just... It's not like it doesn't matter. It'll all work out when we get to heaven. Yes, you'll get to heaven if you're a believer. But, you know, God is right now, and this is the point, he is preparing us for eternity. If we're living this life as though all that there is, all that there is or we're living this life, in essence, to, to ourselves, then we're not going to be living in the fear of God. When someone is living for eternity, when we're looking and understanding we will be in the presence of God for eternity, then you will live in the fear of God. So fear of God means living a life of devotion to him now while being focused on our eternal home. How do we do that? As we said, it's by the spirit of God. It comes by faith in Christ. You need to be a believer. It is produced by obedience to his word. We need to recognize who God is and dwell in his word. You know, read it, hear it, meditate it apply it to our lives, even memorize it, and then spending time in his presence. And all of that will remind us that, you know, we are pilgrims and strangers. We're living through this world and we can, as we live out this world, live in the fear of God, but it doesn't make us cower. It actually makes us confident. We can have a confidence because our hope is not in ourselves. Our hope is not in this world. Our hope is a living hope and it's in God and his promises. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for uh, what has been a fairly extensive teaching this morning. But, Lord, we understand that you know, this is an important point for us to, to realise what it means to fear you. I know in my own life too often I've uh, not understood uh, this, what your word tells us about fearing you. And, and often we do tend to live our lives in maybe a very casual uh, way, and, and not in true reverence for you, Lord. I pray that you would help us uh, in that our thinking would be changed, that we would really understand that you are the almighty God. You are the, the, the holy God. You are excellent. You are glorious. And Lord, that our lives even right now shouldn't just be, we don't live them however we want. We live them in, in honor to you. We live them to glorify you. And Lord, that means that we live them in obedience to you as well. And you've called us in, in your scriptures to not only live in fear, in the fear of, your, of you, but also to live 
holy lives and we, we understand we can only do that as we, we look beyond the things of this world and we look to the fact that you're holy and we want to be like you. So, Lord, help us with these things. Lord, we know that we are weak at times. We are feeble. But, Lord, we know that you give us strength. And, Lord, as we look to you, you will help us to live a life that is pleasing to you to live a life that is dependent upon your grace and how we need your grace for this. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Saviour, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen.